Mary Slusser of Calabar, Pioneer Missionary by W.P. Livingston. Chapter 7 With Back to the Wall Many strange experiences came to Mary Slusser in her life, but it is doubtful whether any adventure equal that which she was now to go through in the quiet places of home, or whether any period of her career was so crowded with emotion and called for higher courage and resource. She remained for the greater part of the time with her mother and sisters at Downfield, seeing few people, and nursing the little black twin who was baptized in Wise Heart Sunday School and called Janie after her friend. One of her earliest visits was to see her friends, the Doegs, in the south side of Edinburgh. And here again, her life touched and influenced another life. There was, in connection with Bristow Street Church, a girl named Jessie F. Hogg, who worked in the mission at Cohen's Close, where the two Marys had formerly taught. She had heard much about Mary Slusser, and when, one Sunday, a lady remarked that she was going to visit the missionary, Miss Hogg declared that she would give much to meet her. "'Then come with me,' said the lady, "'and I will leave you at the foot of the stair, "'and if you are to come up, I will call you.' "'She was invited up, "'and was not five minutes in Mary's presence "'before the latter said, "'And what are you doing at home? "'What is hindering you from going to the mission field?' "'There is nothing to hinder me,' was the reply. "'Then come. "'There is a good work waiting for you to do.' "'Miss Hogg applied to the Foreign Mission Committee "'and was accepted, "'receiving some medical training, "'and was in Calabar before Mary herself returned.' The anticipations of the latter were fulfilled. For thirteen years, with quiet heroism, Miss Hogg did a great work as one of the mothers of the mission. Her name was a household word, both in Calabar and at home, and when, through ill health, she retired, she left a memory that is still cherished by the natives. There were few of the missionaries then who loved and understood Mary better, and whom Mary loved so well. Mary's ideas of the qualities needed for work among the ignorant and degraded may be gathered from a letter which she wrote at this time to a friend in Dundee. Nothing, I believe, will ever touch or raise fallen ones except sympathy. They shrink from self-righteousness, which would stoop to them, and they hate patronage and pity. Of sympathy and patience they stand in need. They also need refinement, for the humble classes respect it, and they are sharper at detecting the want of it than many of those above them in the social scale. I am not a believer in the craze for ticket of leave men and converted prize fighters to preach to the poor and the outcast. I think the more of real refinement and beauty and education that enter into all Christian work, the more real success and lasting, wide reaching results of a Christian and elevating nature will follow. Vulgarity and ignorance can never in themselves lay hold on the uneducated classes or on any class, though God often shows us how he can dispense with men's help altogether. Then there is need for knowledge in such a work, not merely the special passages which are adapted for evangelistic services. They know all the set phrases belonging to special services and open-air meetings. They want teaching, and they will respect nothing else. I am pained often at home that there is so little depth, and of God's word, in the speeches and addresses I hear. It seems as if they thought anything will do for children, and that any kind of talk about coming to Christ and believing on Christ will feed and nourish immortal souls. In January 1884, she informed the Foreign Mission Committee that her health was re-established and that she was ready to return. In accordance with her own desire, it was arranged to make the house habitable at Old Town and send her back there. Meanwhile, she began to address meetings in connection with the missionary organizations of congregations, and at these her simple but vivid style, the human interest of her story, and the living illustration she presented in the shape of Janie, made so great an impression that the ladies of Glasgow besought the committee to retain her for a time in order that she might go through the country and give her account of the work to quiet gatherings of women, young and old. The suggestion was acted upon, and for some months she was engaged in itinerating. It was not in the line of her inclination, she was very shy and had a humble consciousness of her defects, and to appear in public was an ordeal. It was often a sheer impossibility for her to open her lips when men were present, and she made it a condition that none should be in her audience. When some distinguished minister or church leader had been asked to preside, a situation was created as embarrassing to him as to her. She did not, however, seem to mind if the disturbing factor was out of sight, and the difficulty was usually overcome by placing the chairman somewhere behind. These meetings taxed her strength more than the work in Africa, and she began to long for release. In December, the committee gave her permission to return. 
but as conditions in the field had changed, decided to send her in the meantime to Creektown to assist Miss Johnstone, who was not in good health. Within a few weeks, a situation developed which altered her plans. The severe weather had told on the delicate constitution of her youngest sister, Janie, quiet, timid girl, but bright and intelligent, and somewhat akin to herself in mind and manner. It was made clear that only a change to a milder climate could save her life. Mary was torn with apprehension. She had a heart that was bigger than her body, and she loved her own people with a passionate intensity, and was ready for any further sacrifice for their sake. Never bold on her own behalf, she would dare anything for others. Thinking out the problem how best she could reconcile her affection for her sister and her duty to the mission, she fell upon a plan which she would have shrunk from proposing had she alone been concerned. If she could take the invalid out with her to Creek Town, and if they were allowed to dwell by themselves, the life of her sister would not only be prolonged, but she herself would be able to continue, by living native fashion, to pay her share of the expenses at home. To the committee, accordingly, she wrote early in 1885, stating that she would not feel free to go to Creek Town unless she was permitted to take her sister with her. The committee received the proposal with a certain mild astonishment. It had many a problem to solve in its administration of the affairs of the missions, but its difficulties were always increased when it came into contact with that incalculable element, human nature. It could not be supposed to know all the personal and private circumstances that influenced the attitude of the missionaries. It could only judge from the surface facts placed before it, and as a rule it decided wisely, and was never lacking in the spirit of kindness and generosity. But even if the members had known of that fluttering heart in Dundee, they could not, in the best interest of the missions, have acquiesced in her scheme, and it was probably well also for Mary that it was gently but firmly put aside. For her, the way out was found in the recommendation of an Exeter lady whom she had met, who advised her to take her sister to Devonshire. She seized on the idea, and forthwith wrote a letter stating that she felt it to be in her duty to remove the invalid to the south of England, where she hoped her health would be restored and asking whether in the event of her own way being cleared she would be allowed to return to Calabar, or whether she was to consider herself finally separated from the mission. Nothing could have been more sympathetic than the reply of the board. It regretted her family afflictions, said it would be glad to have the offer of her services again in the future, and, in consideration of her work, continued her home allowance till the end of April. Meanwhile, Mary had, in her swift fashion, carried off her sister, and her answer came from Devonshire. She thanked the committee for its considerations, but, with the independence which always characterized her, accepted the allowance only up to the end of February. Thus, voluntarily and from a sense of duty, but with a sore heart, she cut herself adrift, for the time being, from the service of the church. As the climate of Devonshire seemed to suit her sister, they went to Topsham, where house was secured with the help of a Mr. Ellis, a deacon in the congregational church to whom she was introduced. It was soon furnished and then her mother was brought down, and for all her toil and self-sacrifice, she was rewarded by seeing a steady improvement in the condition of the invalid, and the quiet happiness of both. The place proved too relaxing for her own health, and she was never free from headaches, but she was not one to allow indisposition to interfere with her service for the master. In the congregational church her winning ways made many friends, and she was soon taking an active part in the meetings and addressing large gatherings on her work in Calabar. And then another event occurred which further complicated the situation. Her sister Susan in Scotland went to pay a visit to Mrs. McCrindle, and died suddenly on entering her house. Mary had now the full responsibility of the home and its upkeep. She was earning nothing, and she had her mother and sister and the African baby to provide and care for. Happily, the invalid continued to improve, and as it was imperative for Mary to be back at work, it was decided that she should apply for reinstatement. She told her mother of the desire to go up country, and asked whether she would allow her to do so if the opportunity came. You are my child, given to me by God, was the reply, and I have given you back to him. When he needs you, and where he sends you, there I would have you be. Mary never forgot these brave words, which were a comfort to her throughout her life. On applying to the Foreign Mission Committee, stating that she was willing, if it saw fit, to go back at once, she was gladly reinstated, and Calabar was consulted regarding her location. As there was some talk of foreign movement, it was resolved to leave the matter over, and send her in the meantime to Creektown. 
Her friends in Topsham assured her that they would look well after her mother and sister. But all the arrangements she had made for the smooth working of the household collapsed a month before she was booked to sail. Her mother suddenly failed and took to her bed. Mary grew desperate with strain and anxiety, and like a wild creature at bay, turned this way and that for an avenue of escape. In her agony of mind she went to him who had never failed her yet, and he gave her guidance. Next day a letter was on its way to Dundee to an old factory friend, asking if she would come and take charge of the household. A strange mingling of pathos and dignity, a passionate love and solicitude, marked the appeal which happily evoked a ready assent. Not less moving in its way was the practical letter she sent to her friend, with long and minute directions as to travelling. There was not a detail forgotten, the mention of which might contribute to her ease and comfort. Her friend arrived a few days before her departure. On Guy Fox Day, Mary wished to take her to a church meeting to introduce her to some acquaintances, but was too afraid to venture out among the roughs. She, who was soon to face alone some of the most savage crowds in Africa. On the sea, the past month receded and became like an uneasy dream. She was content simply to lie in her chair on deck and rest her tired mind and body. On arriving, it was pleasant to receive a warm welcome from all the mission friends, and still more pleasant to find that there had been talk of her going to Ikunatu, to attempt to obtain a footing among the wild people of Okiang. Chapter 8 Bereft Despite her happiness in being back at the work she loved, there was an underlying current of anxiety in her life. Her thoughts dwelt on the invalids at home. She wearied for letters. She trembled before the arrival of the males. Even her dreams influenced her. But she would not allow herself to grow morbid. Every morning, she went to the houses in the mission before breakfast to have a chat and cheer up the inmates. On New Year's Eve, fearing the adoption of European customs by the natives and wishing to forestall them, she invited all the young men who were Christians to a prayer meeting from eleven o'clock till midnight. Then they went up and serenaded Mr. and Mrs. Luke, two new missionaries, whose subsequent pioneer work upriver was a record of toil and heroism. Mr. Luke entered into the spirit of the innovation. He gave out the second paraphrase and read the ninetieth psalm. Prayer was uttered, and the company was separated, singing the evening hymn and ephic. Next morning, the first of the year, 1886, she rose early and wrote a letter, overflowing with love and tenderness and cheer to her mother and sister. It was finished on the third, on the arrival of the home mail. She was at tea with Mrs. Luke, before going to a meeting in the church, when the letters came. I was hurriedly able to wait for mine, she wrote, and then I rushed to my room and behaved like a silly body, as if it had been bad news. It brought you all so clearly before me. At church I sat beside the king and cried quietly into my wrap all the evening. The last words in her letter were, Tell me all your troubles, and be sure to take care of yourselves. She never received a reply. Mrs. Slusser had died suddenly and peacefully at the turn of the year. She had been nursed by loving hands, whilst her medical attendant and the minister of the Congregational Church and his wife showed her much kindness. Three months later, Janie also passed away, and was laid beside her mother in Topsham Cemetery, the deacons and members of the church and many friends attending, showing honor to one whom they had learned to love for her own sake, as well as for her sisters. Mary was inconsolable. I, who all my life have been caring and planning and living for them, am left, as it were, stranded and alone. A sense of desolation and loneliness, unsupportable, swept over her. After all the sorrow that had crowded upon her, she felt no desire to do anything. There is no one to write and tell all my stories and troubles and nonsense to. One solace remained. Heaven is now nearer to me than Britain, and no one will be anxious about me if I go up country. It was characteristic of her that, the same night she heard of her mother's death, she conducted her regular prayer meetings. She felt that her mother would have wished her to do so, and she went through the service with a breaking heart, none knowing what had happened. She wrote hungrily for all the details of the last hours, and specified the keepsakes she wished to have. I would like something to look at, was her repeated cry. To a friend who had taken charge of the home, she was forever grateful. In the midst of her grief, she was thoughtful for her welfare, and attended to the minutest details, 
even repaying the sixpence expended for the postage of her letters to Calabar. All admirers of Mary Slessor will honor this lowly Scotswoman, who came to her help in the day of her greatest need, and who quietly and efficiently fulfilled her task. So the home life, the source of warmth and sweetness and sympathy, was closed down, and she turned to face the future alone. Chapter 9 The Sorrows of Creektown Again, three Marys were in close association. Miss Mary Egerly, Miss Mary Johnstone, and Miss Mary Slusser. During the year, however, the two former proceeded home on furlough, and the last was left in entire charge of the woman's side of the work at Creektown. It was the final stage of her training for the larger responsibilities that awaited her. There was at first little in the situation to beguile her spirits. It was a bad season of rain and want, and she was seldom out of the abodes of sickness and death. So great was the destitution that she lived on rice and sauce in order to feed the hungry, and never had she suffered so much from fever as she did now in Creektown. Her duties lay in the day school, Sunday school, Bible class, and infant class. But, as usual, the more personal aspect of the work engaged her chief energies. The training of her household, which, as she was accompanying a part of Mr. Goldie's house and had less accommodation, was a small one then, took much of her time and thought and wit. First, in her affections, came Janie, now a big and strong girl of four years old, and as wild as a boy, who kept her in constant hot water. She was a link with the home that had been, and Mary regarded her as specially her own. She shared her bed and her meals, and even her thoughts, for she would talk to her about those who had gone. The child's memory of Britain soon faded, but she never ceased to pray for all in Scotland who remember us. She was made more of than was good for her, but was always brought to her level outside of Creektown. Mary had heard that both her parents were dead, but one day the father appeared at the mission house. She asked him to come and look at his child. He shrugged his shoulders and said, Let me look from a distance. Mary seized him and drew him towards the child, who was trembling with terror. In response to a command in Efik, the girl threw her arms around his neck, and his face relaxed and became more beautiful. When he looked into her eyes and she hid her head on his breast, the victory was complete. He set her upon his knee and would scarcely give her up. Although he lived a long way off, he returned every other day with his new wife and a gift of food. Next came a girl of six years, whose father was Christian. She also was full of tricks, and who with Janie was enough for one house. But there was also Oaken, a boy of about eight, whose mother was a slave with no voice in his upbringing, but whose mistress wished him to be trained up for God, a mischievous fellow whose new clothes lasted usually about a week, but willing and affectionate, and on the whole, good. And another boy of Tem named Ekim, a son of the king of Old Town, whose mother gave him to marry when she first went out. On her departure for Scotland, he had gone back to his heathen home and its fashions, but returned to her when she settled in Creektown. He was truthful, warm-hearted, and clever, and as a free boy and heir to a responsible position, the molding of his character gave her much thought and care. The last was Inyang, a girl of thirteen, but bigger than Mary herself, possessing faithfulness, truthfulness, honesty, and an industry without a peer. She hated to dress or to leave the kitchen, but she washed, baked, and did the housework without assistance, and was kind to the children. These constituted her inner circle but she was always taken in and caring for derelict children. At this time there were several in the house or yard. Two were twins, five months old, whom she had found lying on the ground discarded and forlorn, and who had developed into beautiful children. Their father was a drunken parasite with a number of wives whom he battered and beat in turn. Another castaway came to her in a wretched state. The father had stolen a dog, and the mother had helped him to eat it. The owner threw down a native charm at the door, and the woman sickened and died, and as all believed that the medicine had killed her, no one would touch the child. The woman's mistress was a daughter of old King Iwe, and a friend of Mary, and she sent the infant, dirty and starved, to the mission house with her compliments. Mary washed and fed it and nursed it back to decent life, but on sending to the mistress a request that one of the slave women might care for it, she got the reply, let it die. She let it live. In the mornings, while busy with her household, there were perpetual interruptions. Sick folk came to have their ailments diagnosed and prescribed for. Some of the diseases she attended to were of the most loathsome types, but that made no difference in her compassionate care. Hungry people came to her to be fed. Those in trouble visited her to obtain advice and help. Disputes were referred to her to be settled. When all the cares had been dealt with, she would go her rounds at the yards. 
the inmates of which had come to look upon her as a mother. She would sit down and chat with them and discuss their homes, children, marketing, illness, or whatever subject interested them, sometimes scolding them, but always leading them to the only things that mattered. If I told you what I had seen and known of human sorrow during the past months, you would weep to your heart ached, she wrote to her friend. Some of her experiences she could not tell. They revealed such depths of depravity and horror that the actions of the wild beasts of the bush were tame in comparison. At Creektown, as elsewhere, it was not easy to tabulate what had been achieved, as the fact that women could not make open professions without incurring the gravest penalties kept the missionaries ignorant of the effect of their work. But Mary saw behind the veil. She knew quiet women whose souls looked out of their eyes, and who were more in touch with the unseen than they dared tell. Women who prayed in communion with God, even while condemned to heathen practices. There is one blind woman whom she placed far before herself in the Christian race. She is so poor that she has not but one farthing in the world. But what she gets from us, not a creature to do a thing for her, her house all open to rain and sun, and into which the cows rush at times. But blind Mary is our one living, bright, clear light. Her voice is ever set to music, a miracle to the people here, who only know how to groan and grumble at the best. She is ever praising the Lord for some wonderful manifestation of mercy and love, and her testimony to her Savior is not a shabby one. The other day I heard the king say that she was the only visible witness among the church members in the town. But he added, she is a proper one. Far advanced in spiritual knowledge and experience, she knows the deep things of God. That old hut is like a heaven here to more than me. Pray for us here, was the appeal in all her letters to Scotland at the time. Pray in a business-like fashion, earnestly, definitely, statedly. For herself she found a friend in King Io, to whom she could go at any time and relate her troubles and receive sympathy and support. She, in turn, was often in his stateroom, advising him regarding the private and complicated affairs of his little kingdom, and his relations with the British government. He honored her in various ways, but to her the dumb affection of a slave woman whom she had saved was more than all the favors which others, high in the social scale, sought to show her. Chapter 10. The Fullness of the Time The question of her future location received much consideration. The needs of the stations on the Cross River, the highway into the interior, were urgent, and it was thought by some that the interests of their mission called for her presence there. But her mind could not be turned from the direction in which she believed she could do the best work. She was essentially a pioneer. Her thoughts were forever going forward, looking past the limitations and the hopes of others, into the fields beyond, teeming with populations as yet unreached. She was of the order of spirits to which David Livingston belonged. Like him, she said, I am ready to go anywhere, provided it be forward. From the district's inland came reports of atrocity and wrong, accusations of witchcraft, the ordeal of the poison bean, the shooting of slaves, and the destruction of infants, and she felt the impelling call to go and attack these evils. It was not that she did not recognize the value of base work, of order and organization and routine. The fact that she spent twelve years in patient and loyal service at Duke Town, Old Town, and Creek Town demonstrates how important she considered these to be. But they had been years of training meant to perfect her powers before she went forward on her own path to realize the vision given her from above, and they were now ended. For her, the fullness of the time had come, and with it the way opened. The local mission committee decided in October 1886 to send her into the district of Okiang, and informed the authorities in Scotland of the fact, carefully adding that this was in line with her own desire. A change had just been made in the relation of the women on the staff of the mission to the administration at home. The Zanana scheme of the church had been constituted as a distinct department of the foreign mission operations in 1881, and having appealed to the women of the congregations had proved a success. It was now thought expedient that the Calabar lady agents should be brought into the scheme, and accordingly in May 1886 they became responsible to the Zanana Committee and through them the Foreign Mission Board. The Zanana Committee recommended that the arrangement regarding Mary should be carried out, and the Foreign Mission Board agreed. <laughs>